OK. So first of all, uh, I remind you what is going to happen. Always check the schedule on the course website. OK. So today we are here. We are talking about uh, web applications. Uh, so an introduction to web applications and to the server part that you are going to implement in the next lab. And remember, next lab is uh, on Monday, OK? Not on Tuesday, because we did that swap to facilitate uh, students uh, you know, to go home for, uh, for Easter, uh, Easter holidays, OK? Shh. So we, uh, we will have the lab in room uh, R4, OK? The usual uh, rooms. Rooms are uh, unchanged, OK? Depends on the day. Those are the rooms that are assigned to us. And then we will have lecture in room 10i. OK, so for, for all of you, um, three hours, OK, with the break, of course. Uh, and uh, on Monday, the lab will be split in two groups. Uh, uh, or, I mean, the, the room is big, so if you would like to stay a bit more, it's fine. OK, or if you would like to come earlier, that's fine as well. I will publish uh, the text of the lab soon this afternoon after the lecture because the text of the lab is related to what we are going to see now okay today okay so let's start with uh, today's topic uh, this topic uh, uh, this topic is quite general it's uh, just an introduction to web application we will probably you know a lot of, uh, about the web applications but we will focus on them more important things, okay? Uh, what what we, do, we will need for uh, next lectures, okay? In the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, most of these concepts you should already have them wi with you, uh, already acquired in previous uh, classes, courses, and so on, uh, even in the uh, bachelor level degree, okay? And everything we will mention here will be presented in more details uh, while we proceed in the course, OK? So don't worry too much if there are acronyms uh, and so on. You don't understand that, that well. I mean, there will be topics uh, for the next, day, next lectures, OK? So this is the generic uh, diagram of a web application. OK, a web application architecture where there's somebody that's us, that's a user that interacts with uh, a, a computer or, in general, an electronic device, tablet, smartphone, or whatever. That is what we call front end. The user uses this device. And then through the network, this device communicates with a other, another device that uh, is far from us, typically in, in the cloud. We say in the cloud, so somewhere uh, attached to the internet in some point of the global internet, OK? And this is uh, the so-called back-end part. And this part could be quite complicated, while the front-end part is typically a program running on a, a simple device, like a, a laptop or a smartphone or a tablet. Typically, that is the browser in our case for web applications. Here on the server part, we can have uh, more complicated stuff like uh, um, um, you know, uh, database systems and so on. Okay? So that's a generic uh, diagram of the architecture. Here uh, we, found, we find the browser. Uh, and this is just a list of technologies uh, that are typically available in, in the browser. And again, we will talk uh, in about them in more details in next lectures, OK? We already started to discuss JavaScript, which is the language that we will use to program the browser. Uh, but we will talk about the rest uh, uh, soon. Then we have uh, the communication part. And the communication part in web applications is uh, typically performed through one protocol that is the HTTP protocol, OK? Hypertext Transfer Protocol. You should already have seen this protocol uh, in, in the bachelor degree when you, when you talked about protocols in computer network courses, OK? 
uh, so you have a general understanding on how the HTTP protocol works. We will just add uh, one more thing today, how to efficiently transmit the data that can be easily uh, encoded and decoded by our web application. We will use a specific uh, data format, but that is on top of HTTP, okay? Uh, that will be JSON. This is just a very quick summary of the HTTP protocol. So HTTP protocol works uh, uh, using uh, uh, the, the uh, request response paradigm. So the client should initiate the communication, makes a request. That's the big blue arrow here. With uh, some, uh, uh, let's say, data and metadata information. So a request for a certain resource. Um, sending also other metadata information. We don't need to focus on, on this now. And on the other end, the backend, so the web server, the, 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 the program that uh, speaks the HTTP protocol replies with an HTTP response that includes some metadata as well and some content, actually depending on what we asked, okay? could be empty content, could be some content and so on. We will come back to this later. This is uh, um, standardized. I mean, we, we, uh, the, there are publicly available standard, uh, standard documents that are, for, for the case of internet, typically RFCs that specify these uh, behaviors, what is allowed and what is not in HTTP and so on, okay? Um, so in, in the response, basically, we get uh, the data that is interesting for our application. So something to show in the browser, to show to the user, okay? Uh, well, depending on what happens, as I told you, could be empty, uh, an empty body, so nothing to show. I mean, everything is encoded in the metadata. Typically, there has been an error, so there's nothing to, say, to tell to the client. Or could be static content. Uh, something to be shown in the form of, in the interface of the browser, or could be content which is been uh, dynamically generated, created, processed uh, by the server. Okay. Um, HTTP doesn't really care about uh, what we insert in the payload. We just need to say which is the format of the payload. There's a specific header, so it means uh, there's uh, a line of the previous ones. Uh, that says uh, uh, content type, so uh, which is the format of the rest of the content, so the body part of the, con of the response that we are going to give to the um, client, okay? So that the client can interpret the content correctly. Could be text, could be HTML code that we will see in a, in, in a lecture in a few days. Could be JSON, so this format for communicating data and so on. Okay, so it, HTTP could carry anything, including binary content, for instance, uh, images and so on. Okay, could carry anything. Uh, HTTP is suitable for any type of content, uh, and we will use it basically for for everything. Of course, the basic uh, stuff. So initial stuff to be loaded by the browser, so an initial page uh, with some formatting and some code, JavaScript, and then to exchange data in the format that we like, and, uh, and I anticipated to you that we will like JSON. And so this is what happens uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, actors involved in the uh, request response transaction. So when we request, uh, make a new HTTP request, we send from the client uh, an HTTP request, potentially with some data, okay? So like uh, we would like to add some information to the server. Uh, they ask you to provide your name, uh, uh, first name, last name, address, etc. This stuff needs to be sent to the server. The server interprets with the request Eventually, it will uh, process it with some uh, logic. It means uh, some programs, some algorithms that deal with the request. And we'll come out with something to send back to the client, okay? In the very most uh, simplest transaction, web transaction, 
this response is typically HTML, so something to show directly in, in the browser window, okay? Um, so, as you see, the server part is a bit complicated, more complicated than here on the client side. The client side just need to take input from, from the user, encode it, send the request, and wait for the response, and process the response and show uh, update the, the, the window accordingly, okay? And this, uh, the server part here uh, needs to do some operation. There are operations that are requested to make our application work. There are a number of HTTP uh, methods uh, that you can use. Um, they are all standardized, of course. Uh, you should be familiar with this concept. Uh, basically, the method is what, what we so here in the first uh, slide here, um, the, the first word here, the get, okay? Get means basically take uh, uh, the, the content uh, corresponding to a certain resource, okay? And give it back to me, to the requester, okay? But there are other methods uh, standardized in HTTP because these methods have a meaning says to the server to process what our request in a different way, okay? Get means uh, give me some the content, some content, okay? While, for instance, post uh, means that uh, uh, we would like to update something, okay? Uh, or actually, better, better say, create something, okay? And here you find uh, quite a number of characteristics, but you should... Uh, um, be already familiar with this uh, with this stuff, okay? Just let me check everything is working. Yes, okay. Uh, we will come back to these methods because they are very important. Today we will spend some time on these methods, and then we have the server, the what we generically call web server uh, that serves pages, files, and so on, but also has some logic to compute answers. Okay, so there's some code running on the server. For instance, uh, interfacing with databases, uh, or just do some computation that can be done only on the server side. Okay, uh, or we would like to do on the server side. Um, so, in short, a web server is basically a program that is able to manage the HTTP protocol. So understand the HTTP protocol, read the information coming from the request, and in some way process the request, eventually with the help of uh, some other programs, uh, external programs, systems, and so on, and sends back uh, a re a, an answer. And in, let's say, in the traditional way of uh, developing web application, typically sends back uh, directly what to show in the browser, in the browser window, so a web page, okay? Um, but that's why we are introduced, making this introduction, because we are going to use the web server in a, a little different way, okay? So, um, of course, uh, the web server can retrieve static content. I mean, like, uh, you have a document with some text and so on that's already stored on the server. Okay, you would like to read it. You ask for it, they give it, the, the server gives uh, the text to you, okay? Or there are images, there are videos, other type of media content. You ask for the content, uh, the content is transferred to you, it means the client, and the browser in some way shows it to you. But also it can generate the content dynamically, okay? Um, okay, one thing we, we need to note uh, is that uh, there is one HTTP connection for each request. So the uh, HTTP protocol um, I mean is, um, is a request response protocol. So each request is independent from all the other requests that the client will do. Okay, at least in theory, at least in the beginning, we need to think in these terms, okay? And then in the metadata, we can add the other information so that we can link requests together so that this, the server can in some ways link uh, 
request together, etc. But the HTTP protocol is just a, a, an exchange of a, a request and a response. Okay? So the one HTTP transaction is one request and one response. Okay? Um, of course, web servers, however, uh, uh, deal with many clients at a time. Okay? There's not just one client. There are many clients. Think of any famous website, Google, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you, Polytechnico website, okay? You're not alone in asking the server something, okay? So the web server needs to be able to process different requests, even concurrent requests coming from different sources, okay? This is just a couple of uh, graphs, uh, I mean, not so important, just to give you an idea that there are many different web server softwares around, okay? Uh, they can be more or less popular, for instance, until a few years ago, there was one that was, uh, let's say, more dominant, and then you see now, you know, there are many different approaches to develop a web server, I mean, to, to implement web servers, uh, and so also in terms of software used on the server side, okay? And just a curiosity, this is all sites and this the active sites, okay? Uh, but just statistics, uh, just to give you a rough idea. I mean, at the moment there is no, uh, let's say, dominant uh, um, uh, soft, uh, server software, okay? Uh, but, I mean, just to know. Coming to our course, well, um, we had to make a choice. We need a web server because without the web server, we cannot make an app a, a web application work. Yes, th that's a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, if something happened in June 2000. June 2000. <laughs> 2000? 18. Oh, 18. Uh, yeah. I mean, not not really sure. <laughs> my, might be. My, might that. Uh, you know the. Um, uh, th this is ah. This is other. No, it's not uh, engines. Uh, not really sure. We should search <laughs> in the web. Maybe, maybe some some flow in some some bugs uh, in Apache that was one of the most common um, web server software was discovered, and that, that's why it had this drop. I mean, but uh, I mean, not really sure. I mean, but this is just you know sort of curiosity. Okay. Because if we were in, like in 2010, I would say, well, everybody uses Apache, <laughs> okay? Nowadays, uh, this is no, no more true, okay? Okay, so in our course, we had to make a choice. And we tried to make a choice which is uh, reasonable for, for our course, but at the same time, not too limiting. So, um, well, I already saw that we, um, I already uh, said, sorry, that uh, uh, we would like to use uh, the JavaScript programming language, so we don't have to learn another programming language just for the server side, which is not really the focus, the main focus of the course. And so we would like to have something that can be, uh, can work uh, with JavaScript. So we need a JavaScript interpreter, and this JavaScript interpreter that runs as a standalone program, as any other web server, will be Node for us. And since in this in node that we saw since the first lecture, uh, we can uh, include different packages, libraries, and so on. The point is uh, uh, finding a good package that implements uh, what is needed for us to implement a web server, okay? So uh, that's a choice we made and the choice you should use in this course. Uh, the library is uh, package is called Express is very simple and extensible web server, uh, and um, it's uh, useful for us because it doesn't require uh, too, mu too much programming, and uh, it's uh, well integrated in the node environment. It has many packages useful to accomplish all the tasks that we will need in web applications, for instance, uh, later for you know, implementing uh, uh, authentication, authorization, or to handle the, 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 the data format that I mentioned, the JSON, and so on. So everything is already 
I mean, ready for us, and we can just focus on programming and not on you know implementing something that is not there yet. But I would like to stress this is just a choice that we made for our course because we need to fit into eight uh, credits, right? So we cannot just spend uh, you know half of the course programming on, on the server side. Uh, we could have done it, uh, but uh, this is no more a, a, like a, a web application course. It's more like a web uh, architecture course, okay? Um, so we, in this course, we focus mostly on the client part, but we would like to give you an idea also on the server part. Uh, any of the previous web servers uh, could be used to you create uh, uh, a web server that works with our application. Okay, uh, but we did this choice just for our convenience. Okay, so when you go out, uh, you you get your degree and you go to work in you know this field and you develop web application, you probably will not be using a Node plus Express as the web server. Okay, but the concepts are similar, and it doesn't really matter because uh, you see in this scheme, in this uh, diagram. Uh, I mean, this is uh, one environment, so it's one computer system, the client, and the other is another computer system, and the server in two different places, uh, and they are completely separated. The only thing that matters is that they speak, okay? They talk the same language. They agree on what to exchange, okay? Okay. So... Uh, we also need a persistence layer in the sense that the web server alone is not enough. Express doesn't give us uh, this persistence layer. So when we need to save information, we need to save it somewhere. And as I said last time, we need a database. Why a database? Because it's very easy to store information in a database. You are familiar with SQL language and you can easily implement uh, queries uh, that store and retrieve data uh, 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 according to what you need, okay? Uh, there are different options here as well. Basically, the option for this part, we already saw it last time, that is the SQLite 3, okay? That's the database that fits directly into a file and we have libraries uh, to handle that uh, format, okay? So, uh, before going on and discussing the rest, uh, I would like to explain to you which is the architectural pattern that we are going to use and, and learn in this course, okay? Because it's not, um, I mean, this, this architecture has evolved over time and the traditional architectural pattern was that uh, for each request, the server did computation and created a new page. A page means uh, a new aspect of what you are going to show into the uh, uh, browser window, okay? So everything was computed on the server side. That was the beginning of how web applications work. Actually, at that time, there were not really applications. I mean, when you had dynamic content coming from the server, you can call it application. It was more like web browsing than web application, just retrieving documents. But at a certain point, we added the possibility on the, on the server side to you know, do some processing, create content dynamically, and you started to have web application. Web application means that uh, uh, depending on what you request, you get a different answer. Like in a normal application, local application on a PC, you interact with the interface and, and the application reacts to your interaction, not just a static content. Uh, and this is the traditional architectural pattern. So everything is computed on the server side or most of the things are computed on the server side. Uh, including, especially including the content to show to the user, okay? Uh, so in this traditional architectural pattern, we say that the web application is doing server-side rendering. M rendering means creating the interface, the new interface, the new view for the user, okay? You 
you say okay I submit this okay everything changes and the new view is transmitted to the client the client is just to show the new view to the user okay and in this way also we create uh, a multi-page web application means that uh, depending on where you are you can have a uh, one view another view another view but also a different page and the page basically is uh, uh, you request a different resource from the server okay uh, with the http protocol because the, 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 let's say the, the login page the main uh, uh, content page the detailed uh, uh, the page with the details of some item the page where you do the checkout if you are you know buying something uh, the pay confirmation page when you did uh, some action and so on these are pages which are also views okay but they say pages computed in the traditional way in traditional architectural pattern on the server side okay that's the traditional way of thinking about uh, web application but it's not really m the modern way okay uh, for coming to the modern way that is the way that we will learn in this course let's have a look at this diagram that summarizes what I told you so basically here you have the browser on the left with this uh, JavaScript runtime environment, okay? In the browser, we can execute some code. Also, traditional applications were able to execute some code. JavaScript was born exactly for this reason, 1995, okay? To execute some code on the, on the server side. Oh, on the, sorry, the client side, okay? So, to react uh, a little bit to the user interaction. And the traditional way of uh, navigating in uh, a web application was that uh, uh, the browser you know decides uh, actually the user does something the browser decides to send a new request to the server the server process the request in s and decides to send back a response and the typical response in a new page to show a new uh, uh, content to show okay then over time things uh, got more complicated because the more possibilities you have on the on the client side so possibility to program peculiar behaviors uh, when when the user interacts with the with the content of the page and the more possibility you have to send and decide when to send requests on the uh, to the server okay and so uh, in addition to sending new requests for for each page by the browser automatically every time we load a new page the browser automatically sends a new request to the server at a certain point uh, in the runtime of the browser so with javascript we were able to send other requests additional requests to the server typically requesting not new pages because uh, you know handling pages was uh, the the task of the browser but uh, data okay and so with this data and some processing here on the client we could update a part of the page okay that was uh, let's say uh, the first step towards uh, uh, the, this uh, modern way of interpreting web application the modern way of interpreting the web application is to have uh, what is called a single page application so there are no more pages uh, for for our web application every time we send a request for a page to the server the server always answer with the same page and everything is constructed on the client side how with the mm, javascript that we will learn to program in this course in the rest of this course okay and so what are we going to show in the client if uh, we always get the same page well, actually, there's one uh, request that will load the initial page, okay? And there will be other requests that will uh, uh, load data, raw information, what we call here raw information. So just the data that we need to populate the views that we create on the client side, okay? That's the modern way of creating a web application, okay? So in short, there's a lot of code, JavaScript code, running on the client part. 
that changes the content and the aspect of the page and basically makes uh, the, the, the content of the browser change, uh, react to user interaction and change maybe also a lot. So everything is, uh, let's say, deleted and reconstructed in a different way and so on. So it's more or less like creating new pages, but it is done ent entirely on the client side and uh, um, uh, to, to construct a new uh, views, you need to have the information and so we will focus in short on constructing uh, this uh, um, the server that provides the information, the data needed to, to, uh, to construct the views and, and their content. Yeah, that's a question. Uh, uh, this means that in the past there were a lot of static pages uh, for one of for each request. Well, in short, uh, more or less, yes. Okay. If the site was completely static, that's true. If the site was partially dynamic, uh, there were pages that each one of them contained con uh, code that could be interpreted and change a little bit the aspect of the page. But we had multiple pages, typically, uh, as you said, okay? And that was the problem, because uh, when we well would like to desc uh, describe a page, we need a, a, um, a language that is suitable to describe pages, which we will see it's HTML, okay? But we also need to insert the code, because we want to have dy uh, dynamic uh, parts of the page, right? So. Uh, I mean, that, that's a possible way of proceeding to create web application, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, we are embedding the code that uh, um, creates the, the element that contains the actual data of the application inside a static page that is just the frame in which we would like to put it, okay? Here, we are separating the two things. Uh, actually, almost, uh, I mean, destroying the part of the page because there's just one frame, uh, an empty page that will be populated in which a lot of, con I mean, all the content will be created dynamically by the language, by the JavaScript language on the basis of the data and only the data that we will get from the server, okay? These things will be more clear in, in a few minutes, I hope, okay? So in short, we are moving from the left to the right. So in the traditional uh, approach, we have the browser, um, which is actually the same from the left to the right. But uh, uh, the server is not creating you know, uh, pages anymore, but it's sending only data nowadays, okay? So you always have a request and you always have uh, uh, all the services that compute the new data because the new data has to be computed in some ways. But what it changes is that in the traditional approach, you would like to provide something which was more or less complete, ready to show for the browser, while on the right, in the modern way of thinking about web applications, you only provide the data and it's the client task to create the corresponding interface and populate it with the data that uh, we provide from the server, okay? So why we would like to move from the left to the right, okay? It's not just a way of better organizing the code that could be, you know, questionable <laughs> uh, because some, some, some of you or some, some people in general might prefer this approach. It's because if we do things on the client side, so close to the user, there will be no uh, page reloading uh, um, events. So you don't need to wait for the new page to be loaded. Remember, the page here is served from the server and it needs to arrive to the client. So there's the network in the middle, okay? And while you're waiting for the new page, the browser can you know, do many things, but um, typically if you need to load a new page, you need to delete everything and wait for the new page to be loaded, okay? 
Well, if you already have the page and you just need to update the data, the content, that's much faster, okay? So it's true that you need to wait for the data, but while you are, you are waiting for the data, there's nothing that disappears or, or it's waiting to be loaded and so in the window you don't have anything to see and so on, okay? So in short, this uh, shift from the traditional to the uh, single page application paradigm was basically driven to, uh, um, by uh, the need to have a better user experience, okay? The user experience that you feel today with the modern web application is that you click and, and you interact and things typically happen quite uh, quickly, okay? Uh, it might happen that, uh, you know, connection is not so fast and so if you have a lot of data to, to load, it might take a while, okay? But, uh, I mean, you still have something, you always have something to interact with, okay? These are very uh, typical examples of uh, single page application, very famous ones. Uh, I think everybody of you has used the Google Doc, right? Google Doc is actually a web application. You don't uh, have a, 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 a word processor locally installed. I mean, just open the browser, open the, the URL of the Google Doc, and everything happens on the client. But you know that your document is, is saved in some ways on Google servers. So what is exchanged between client and server? Data is exchanged, like here on the right, just data. Uh, and you know, uh, it tells you, wait, well, I saved everything. You type something, and when you type, you change the user interface, okay? The user interface understands that you are typing something, it takes what you, uh, what you typed, it sends it to the server, and the server at a certain time, it says it's saved. But the user interface doesn't change. I mean, all the buttons, all the stuff that you need to create a, a, a an environment that is very similar to a normal, traditional word processor stays there. Doesn't change, doesn't move. You, uh, it doesn't need to be reloaded. This was basically impossible if you need to have a new page each time you press a button and you want to do something in your word processor, okay? So that's why we are moving towards a, a, a system like this, okay? But this is not the only reason uh, no, okay, before, before the, the other reasons. Okay, uh, there are also disadvantages, not just, uh, you know, advantages, uh, as I told you. So, no page reloading uh, waiting time. So, in general, you don't need to wait uh, too much when you are interacting and using functions of your web application. But, of course, it's, uh, basically you have a single page and uh, search engines relied on the fact that in web, uh, in web uh, sites, websites, basically, there were many pages. You know, what is called search engine optimization became difficult because the content is not there. You need to execute the JavaScript to create the content. And the, uh, the web crawler, you know, Google, uh, Bing, uh, and whatever else, is going to index uh, websites around, uh, doesn't have the time and the resources and doesn't want to run your JavaScript code, right? To create content. So it just reads the, the first page that is served that is basically empty, okay? So of course, uh, many things have been done to solve this problem, but of course, uh, I mean, this is not a, a, an a easy to solve problem, okay? Also, browser history is not working. You know that in the browser you have a back and forth button and you can move to the previous page and the next page because the browser was born with the idea of having pages. If we have a single page application, there's nothing uh, pre uh, before our page and there's nothing after, okay? So the back and forth buttons don't work anymore unless we will employ some tricks and make them work, okay? Uh, but we need these tricks, okay? And also, there are quite a number of security issues which are especially interesting for this course, and we will discuss especially about cross-site scripting, uh, because if all the logic is in the client, uh, 
we need to be extra careful when processing requests coming from the client. If computation is done on the server, we know what is happening because the, the user is not controlling the server. The user is controlling the client. The user can you know, open the browser and, and play with the content, okay? And you can send other requests. You can, say, you can see which requests have been sent and all this stuff, okay? But if things are happening on the server, you cannot touch what is happening on the server, okay? So this also takes uh, mm, us to, mm, to the need to think about some security issues, okay? And also client-side rendering can be slow. Don't forget about this. It's true that today's computers, smartphones, etc., are are quite powerful, but we also would like to have complicated uh, uh, web applications. Think again about Google Doc. I mean, uh, quite a number of things that can be done, right? Or, or if you need to load a lot of data, okay? This data is just data. The interface, uh, the, the, what is shown to the user needs to be created and a lot of code, a lot of JavaScript code has to be run, okay? Okay, so this is uh, one of the ap modern approach, single page application. There are, let's say, some uh, 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 other approaches that are basically derived by the single page application idea. This isomorphic application, so it's a combination of uh, single page application with some server side rendering, for instance, to solve some of these problems, the search engine optimization. So that when, when, the, when uh, the search engine asks for a page, we don't serve an empty page. Something is rendered also on the server side, but this is just a compromise, okay? or for instance to speed up rendering on the client if the client is not that powerful. But this is just a, 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 you know, a, a derivation from, from the first idea of the single page application. And also progressive web app, uh, which actually are web application that emulate native apps, okay? So in some ways they should have uh, some sort of local storage to be used when there is no network connection and so on. A web application works well, but you need to have a network connection that is always working, okay? If you lose the network connection, there's no data that you can exchange with the server. And if the data is with the server, you, you are with a nice application, but no data. It's like you are running an application without the file system, okay? So you cannot store data and you cannot uh, retrieve data if you need, okay? So there are things that need to be taken into account to you know, when you are transitioning to this uh, new uh, pattern, a web uh, architecture pattern. Okay, uh, one last thing, important thing, because today's uh, it's more and more important. If we approach the development of web application with a system, with, with an architecture like this, where we have HTTP requests that retrieve data, actually the client could be a, uh, something which is not just a web browser, but can be something else. For instance, think about the mobile applications here, right? We all use uh, apps on smartphones, right? And they need to talk with the server to get data, okay? They are programmed in a different way. Sometimes they are just, uh, you know, like a small web pages put into an app, okay? That's why you do you download like a, a 100 megabyte app, because typically that's a browser embedded in your application. But if it's a native application and doesn't do anything really complex, doesn't need to be so heavy, uh, but it needs to have a place where uh, it can go and take the data. And this place is the server. And we don't want to use uh, you know, a different backend for the client, uh, which is the browser, and a different backend for the client that it is the native mobile application and so on, okay? Um, so we would like to have a single backend because it's also, you know, quite difficult to develop, especially if it does com complex things. And so with this scheme where the browser basically create the pages, which are not present in native application. We are not using pages in native application. If we are serving data and the, the client decides how to use the data, 
this schema, uh, this, um, this way of developing the uh, application server works for any client that we might have, okay? Browser-based, native application, desktop, mobile, etc. we don't really care uh, because they will do the same exact request to retrieve the data and the backend can be exactly the same, okay? So this is just, again, curiosity. What are doing the, the big players here in, uh, you know, uh, in, in the field, like Google, Facebook, YouTube, etc. You might notice that on the front end, basically, if you have a browser, it means that you program in JavaScript. And that's why we are learning JavaScript and we are you know, learning how to program a web application using JavaScript and the browser, okay? Uh, and on the back end, you can have uh, a lot of technologies. Uh, you see Node as well here, okay? Uh, in some ways, uh, in some places, it can be useful, but there are many other technologies as well, okay? Uh, well, database, etc. Database, we don't really care too much because it's kind of an external service. Uh, and depends on what you need, uh, you might need different uh, type of software, okay? Uh, so this is the introduction to our web application. What you need to remember is that we are going to follow this single page application pattern. Means that uh, uh, the server sends the exact w same web page for every unique use. And I would add, it sends it only once. At the beginning, you load your application well, the, that means that you click on a link or you, or you type the link in the um, web browser URL uh, field, and that's all. You load your page, you will never reload the page, okay? By the way, if you reload the page at the exam, that will be an error, okay? And we will see it because it takes not so much time, but a little bit of time. And you can see that the browser is reloading the page, okay? We don't want to reload the page, okay? We would like to follow this approach. And so once the, the application is loaded the first time, that's all, okay? And the application gets unloaded only when you go to another website, okay? We don't want to see page reloading, okay? Okay, fine. And I explained you why. So if you have questions, you can ask, otherwise we'll move to the next uh, set of slides. They are quite quick today, I mean. Um, and uh, in the end of the three hours lecture, uh, I will show you something in practice. Uh, so an example of where to start for the next lab. So we say that we are going to start from the server side, okay? The idea of the image is from my colleague from previous years, okay? And we will use this library, which is called Express, and we will ask you to use this library also for submitting the project for the exam, okay? We know that there might be other options, other languages and so on, but we need to have something, you know, uniform to, to be quite quick in testing, okay? and also to be very familiar with the technology as well, okay? So the idea here is, let's try to develop a very simple web server and um, using JavaScript language, as I already said, that can host both the static content, so let's say the, the first page of the static resources of our website, images and so on, they don't need to change, they are just files, they need to be served. That's only the only thing. But also, we need to host the dynamic API. So the APIs, the, the, the request that will give us the data that we need to make our application work, okay? And of course, to uh, return data, we need to interface with a, a database. But we partially saw this uh, um, how to interface with the database uh, last time, and you already experienced uh, it uh, in the lab, okay? That's why we started so quickly with the database. So the HTTP protocol, I already talked about the HTTP protocol, but now we recall 
the most important thing that you need to know for this course. Okay? So the messages are composed by an initial line, uh, zero or more header lines, an empty line, this empty line, and then there will be a body, a request body or a response body. That can be optional. Uh, the first lines are mandatory, the first line on the request and then the response are mandatory and the headers are optional, zero or more, okay? So in the first line of the request, you will have the method name, okay? So get, but we already saw post, put, delete, and so on. We'll discuss them uh, in, a, in a minute. Uh, the path of the resource to be requested, typically in the beginning you start with the slash, that is the root, the, the root page, the first page, okay? And then the version of the HTTP protocol, but this is, doesn't care too much, doesn't matter too much for us, it will be inserted by the libraries uh, of the browser automatically. But the, you know, the path need to be specified by us, and also the method needs to be specified by us. So it's, it's us, we are deciding which method we would like to use to get a certain, to access a certain uh, path, so a certain resource. Okay, these are the HTTP methods, get, post, put, delete. There are many more, like head, I, I put it here in gray because, um, I mean, it's a sort of modified get. We won't, we will not use it, okay? The browser maybe internally use it sometimes uh, to check if the resource has been modified or not, but for our purposes, let's say the first uh, four big uh, black methods are the ones you need to remember and the ones that you basically will use in your uh, project and in our web application. Okay, uh, so get, post, put, delete. Get uh, retrieves a resource, okay? Post submits something to the server, typically changing the state of the server. So the server stores the information that we send with the post. Put replaces something on the server some information in the server. So it's a bit different from the post. The post creates something and the put replaces something that already exists. And delete, of course, deletes uh, some resource on the server. Okay, so the first, uh, okay, let's go to the response and then we will come back with some example on how to use the HTTP method. Response, uh, that's a first line is a status line like here. HTTP version, status code, and the phrase, in English phrase that says something about the status code, which are, these are already coded. Uh, there are many of them. If you go to the standard, there are a lot of them, actually. But again, we will use just a few. I mean, uh, the, the most important one is probably this 200, okay. That is the typical answer then when everything is fine, okay? So you get, you ask for a resource, so you send a get, and you get uh, the resource. So the first line is 200 OK, OK? And the second most frequently used is there's something wrong in the request because we cannot find the resource. And so it's a 404 not found, OK? That's a, the, another very common answer. And then there could be other answers depending on the cases. Like we created the resource, there is, there is a problem in the format of what we have sent and so on, an internal error of the server, etc. many other things, okay? So that's the first line of the response. Uh, this stuff can be seen in the browser. Uh, like, uh, let's take a get here, let's make it bigger, okay? Uh, you see the status, okay, this was HTTP2, I mean, don't focus too much, I mean, this is the request, okay, get with the URL, and uh, no, that's a payload, there was no payload in the get, and so this is status 200, okay, um, and uh, well, this was empty, yeah, it was cached, let's take something, and there's a, there's a response, there's a response body, okay? So this stuff can be inspected by the browser, okay? 
we will learn how to do that uh, when, when it's needed okay so there are a lot of status code as I was saying you to you um, before typically the first uh, number in the three num in, tri in the three digits code uh, uh, means the, the 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 class of the um, the status code so starting from one uh, informational to something 200 and something are typically success codes so a different way of saying it has been there has been a success so like everything is okay it's been created accepted and so on but I mean we were able to perform some action 300 redirection uh, we will not use them typically because we have uh, Mm, I mean, we don't need to redirect to any other place. I mean, the server is just ours and we don't interact with others, <laughs> okay? So the 400 are errors, uh, errors uh, in the request, okay? So happening on the client side. So the client has asked us something that was wrong, okay? These are still uh, server status code, but 400 means uh, there was something wrong in the request. I couldn't process it. Okay, because of how the request was formulated. Like typically it's not found, a resource is not found. I ask for a file that doesn't exist. Okay? Uh, or not acceptable or, you know, any, any other problem. Okay? And 500 are typically server errors. Typically uh, this uh, 500 and uh, 500, that's the internal server error that you send back when you are not able to process the request for some reasons and you have no more information to give to the client. For instance, that's a typical case when you don't have the possibility to access the database. The request was correct, uh, nothing wrong with the request, but we should access the database to give you the information and the database for some reason is not available. Okay? Typically, the database is another server, so you cannot connect to the database, you cannot authenticate to the database, or in our case, you have misspelled uh, the database name, okay? In our case, it's, uh, it's just a file, a local file. I mean, not so many things can happen, but, you know, especially in development, you might have misspelled the, fi the file name, or maybe the uh, file permission uh, uh, properties are not uh, suitable for accessing it, it cannot be read and so on okay these are the kind of things that can happen and uh, this uh, this problems uh, yield this uh, server error that is communicated to the client saying well a request was fine but uh, we are not able to process it okay and the client should decide you know what to do with the, this uh, error okay show it to the user uh, typically try it later when you get a <laughs> a page that says uh, uh, server uh, cannot process the request, try it later. That's because something like this has happened. Okay. Okay, so response, response status, uh, and request and response headers. Okay. There are additional information about uh, the request or the response. Many headers are similar, both for the request and the response. One line per header. Um, the syntax is very simple header name. Um, colon header value okay there are a lot of headers defined in the standard only one is mandatory for HTTP 1.1 .1, that's the one that we will use host but it, it, that's inserted automatically by the browser okay the header that really matter to us is this one that I already showed pointed out before content type because on the basis of the content type we know how to interpret the rest of the uh, request or the response, so the body. The body contains uh, text, well, this is not typically the case for web application because web application communicate with HTML, okay? HTML uh, is something that we will uh, see uh, in, in a few lectures um, and that's a way of describing the structure of a page, a web page. Or for us, for today, we will talk a lot about uh, uh, J JSON format, okay? So this is this uh, textual way of representing data, structured data, 
Uh, and that's the way we communicate that the request body or the response body has this format, okay? Why text slash HTML application slash JSON? These are the so-called MIME types. You can go and search. Again, they, they have been standardized. Those are the names, okay? We just need to use them, okay? Uh, okay, content encoded, I don't care too much. Uh, the browser does it for us and the server as well. So, I mean, uh, content can be compressed uh, just to save bandwidth, etc. but it's transparent for us, at least for the libraries and the browser that we use. Okay, so let's come to the HTTP methods because these are really important. Uh, we will come back to these things uh, many times, uh, but... Uh, when you submit your project for the exam, okay, that's a probably the most important thing for you for this class, but also you know, in general, when you, when you would like to decide which HTTP method you should use, you need to refer to this criteria. So uh, we already said, well, the add is not so useful for us. So either we use get or post or put or delete. So there are just four choices. Get is to retrieve a resource. There's nothing that we need to put in the request body. Actually, it's an error to put something in the request body. Actually, we are asking for information, so we have nothing to say. What we would like to have is already in the initial line. It's the name of the resource, the path, slash something, okay? That's what we would like to get, and in the answer, if everything goes, uh, is fine, we get the answer with the content, okay? In the body, okay? And in the body, the, the header content type will tell us which format is the data. Um, okay, what's this column uh, uh, idempotent? Well, idempotent means that if the request is sent again exactly in the same form, if nothing has changed on the server, so, none, I mean, there's nobody that went there and changed something in the, in the meanwhile, okay? Uh, you get the same exact answer from the server. So if you send it once or twice, one time or two times, you will get the exact same result. Of course, if in the middle nothing has changed, okay? This is not uh, what happens uh, for other methods like the POST. Since the POST can send the data to the server and the server store this information, that's a typical behavior of the POST, and so it creates some, something new in the database. If you send it twice, you will have two new objects in the database, two new, two new items. So if you send it once or you send it twice, that's a difference because uh, you create one thing or two things, okay? So this is not idem, idem potent, okay? Uh, the post may have a response body. That's not mandatory. Typically, there's a response body. At least today, we will, we will see an example, at least, uh, I mean, a, that's a good practice to, to give a, a unique identificator of the new resources back to the client, okay? So you create a new object in the database, there's a new ID for this object, you return at least this ID, so that the, the client knows how to reference this new object that, that didn't exist before, okay? Uh, or you can send back uh, you know, the whole object that has been created uh, and so on, okay. We will come back on these uh, things. Put, put uh, uh, yes, requires uh, additional information because you want to update something and you need to say what you would like to update, okay? On, on a given resource that is specified on the initial line, but you would like to say what you uh, uh, want to update. My return something depending on, on the way we would like to structure the request and the response. And this is item potent, so it's different from the post. So it's just an update. So if you want to change something to a specific value, if you change it once or twice, 
the result is the same because the second time you will overwrite something that has already been updated, but the, the final result is exactly the same. Okay? So I want to change uh, my address. There's no more uh, Polytechnico, but University of Torino. I send a request once. I put, okay, it will get updated to University of Torino and I send it a second time. There's already University of Torino, but since I send it to update it for University of Torino, it's already University of Torino. It will be again University of Torino. So th there are no two new um, two updates that lead to do different results. They both lead to the same result. Okay? And the delete uh, my or my not have request or response because the, uh, the identificator of the resource, so the, 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 um, the path that we specify here in the request uh, might be enough, okay? Depends on how we structure the request and the response. Again, for the response, my or might not have uh, something. And that's typically even potent, why? Because uh, it's true that the first time we delete it, we delete the, the resource. The second time, there's nothing to delete, but the effect on the server is the same. At the end of the second uh, request to delete, there's nothing anymore as for the first one. Okay? So, in short, there's just one which is not even potent. So, pay a lot of attention where the post request should be um, used. Okay? By the way, the browser, if you notice that when you use uh, websites and so on, if you are submitting again a post request, typically the browser asks you for a confirmation because they know that the post request, if repeated, leads to a different result on the server. Okay? While for other requests, like a GET, the browser doesn't ask you anything because they don't expect that, uh, there will be an, a a different response from the server. You are not changing the state of the server. You're not creating new items, new things on the server. While for the post, yes. Okay? It's like when you, when you pay something. Okay? You send, you press the button for paying something. You, if you press it twice, you are paying twice. Okay? And that's why the browser asks you, are you really sure you want to send another request? Be careful, there might be side effects. So, like paying again or adding something again, etc. Okay? So this this is really, really important. This that's why I'm I'm you know I'm discussing this a lot. Also for your project, when you're uh, submitting the project for the exam. One of the things we care most is did you use the correct HTTP methods to develop your APIs on the server? We will ask you for, for to submit a document, a very simple text file, with all the API requests, including the method. And that's the first thing we start to read when you are, we are evaluating your project. That's because, well, from the API, you learn, to, uh, you learn a lot on how you structured your application, and that's why we start from there but also what you thought about the action that has, needs to be done by the application, okay? And we care a lot about the methods. If we see a post, we understand that uh, the, that API should perform some important action on the server, creating something, okay? Modifying something on the server. For get, uh, the gets, well, gets read stuff, you can, you know, do many gets and mm, create many gets. It depends on how you want to split the data into different smaller parts, and, but no, that's not really important, okay? Okay, let's come to Express, and then, uh, yeah, not sure if we finish before the break, but anyway, we'll finish this set of slides uh, today, for sure. So Express is a the package that we are going to use. Node has already an HTTP server inside it, so there's a module called HTTP. We are not using that one, it's too simple, uh, not so convenient and so on. So we use Express, which has to be installed in the exact same way of all other packages, the AJS, uh, uh, SQLite3 and so on, nothing new here. Uh, how to run 
an Xbox server, we, we just run a JavaScript file. The difference is that Node uh, with a JavaScript file that contains code to run a web server won't stop. It will stop only when we stop it from the console. A server never stops. It is stopped only externally from the server administrator. The server shouldn't stop. Also, your server for the, for the final project should no, never stop, should never crash as well, okay? Because a crash means it's stopped. Okay. Uh, by the way, there's a very useful um, uh, module that you need to install that you can install that is called node mod. Instead of running node, you can run node mod. And this is very convenient because it automatically restarts the server when you change something in the code. That is especially useful for the development. When, when you are testing uh, something which has been developed for, uh, by others, it doesn't really matter. But uh, this is really useful during the development. Actually, that's the only module, the only package that we uh, uh, suggest to install as global, so with this minus uh, dash g option, okay? Uh, why global? Uh, because it might be useful in many different projects. You can install it locally as well, no, it doesn't really matter, but you need to specify it for each project, okay? To install it uh, globally, you typically need the administrator privilege, okay? In Linux, uh, that's sudo, in Windows could be something else. Um, okay, uh, how does a, uh, a server with Express looks like? But this is really the basic stuff to write to start a, an Express server. So you import the package and you assign it to a, a variable, actually a const, that's better. And then you say, well, please listen on some port that will be a TCP port. That should be clear for you from the computer network's course. Okay, HTTP runs on TCP. In TCP, UDP use a, a multiplexing scheme based on ports. That's a number between one and uh, uh, two to sixteen. Uh, to no, two sixteen. Two to the power sixteen minus one. Okay, sixty-five thousand, etc. Uh, we'll choose a port which is not less than 124 because uh, it requires uh, administrative privilege, but we don't need it. So let's say 3,000, 4,000, whatever, okay? Uh, and that runs the server, okay? But the ser this server doesn't do anything. We need to specify that we would like to answer to certain requests for certain uh, resources. Like, you know, the, most, uh, the, the, the basic resource, that is the, the first resource that is asked by a browser uh, in the beginning, when you connect to a website, just specifying the URL without any path, is slash, okay? So the root, the, the root the directory. So we can say that we would like to answer to the method, HTTP method get to the slash, um, uh, root, so it means a path. Uh, how? Well, using some code. W what does this code do? When you get a request here of type get, so method get, HTTP get, you send back here just a string. This is just an experiment. It's not HTML code and so on. It's just, uh, you know, to play a little bit in the beginning. How is this specified? Well, surprise, that's a callback, right? And a, a, an asynchronous callback. A callback that will be called when the server will receive such a request. It takes two parameters that are basic, uh, basically two objects. One is the request object, and the other is the response object. So from the request, we can extract information about the request, like the body, okay? We don't need the body here. There's no body in the get. But with the rest, we can have methods to say, well, we finished to decide what to answer, and please send back this stuff. So send is a very simple way to send back something to uh, the, uh, in response to the request, OK? So that's the basic uh, um, 
That's a basic way of using app. App uh, means uh, the object created by Express. Uh, here is the method, and the method is the HTTP method, all lowercase. So this could be get, post, put, delete in our application. The path, which is a string, and the handler, which is a callback, okay? Which takes two parameters. And the two parameters have this meaning. They are objects, and there are important uh, properties inside this object, like dot body, dot body gives us access to the body of the request. We will see examples later, which is the method, but actually the method is already known because we had the uh, up get, so it's a get, otherwise we don't get called. The params, since we will have parametric queries, uh, parametric requests and the query, we will have uh, queries as well. Uh, that means what comes after the question mark in the, uh, in the resource name. And the rest has uh, basically three methods. The, the redirect is not to use the basically. So end, end the response, and please send everything back to the uh, client. Uh, the send that we already saw, send the response of various type depending on what you pass. Or JSON, that's a very convenient method because it takes what we pass there, like an object, uh, uh, yeah, typically an object, but could be an array and something else. It gets converted to JSON format and sent back to the client. Okay? Um, so that's just a summary of what we, we said. It's something more, but I mean, not, not as useful. Okay. Um, I, I would say, since I, I've, I can see that you are a bit tired, right? <laughs> uh, let's uh, have a, a, a break here now. Okay, so I prepare a little demo of this stuff. It's very simple, just the code that we saw before. So I show you this uh, little demo when we come back. And then we will finish, uh, and we will finish with the next set of slides and the example that has already been loaded uh, on the GitHub, okay, in week 03, okay? Okay, see you in 10 minutes, more or less.